Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for taking the time this morning to join us for what should be a, a fascinating insight into the hotel sector and its relationship with private equity. We have some exceptional speakers who no doubt bring this subject well into life over the next hour and a half. Um, private equity has changed and influenced the industry in quite a major way over the last two, last two decades. You know, hotels responded particularly well, I think it's fair to say, to the challenges presented by the pandemic uh, since 2020. And yet, and yet last year, we saw some encouraging signs of how it's returning to strength. However, the industry does still face many challenges, uh, still in terms of costs, inflation, energy, staffing, all across the world. So how is this influencing investment opportunities? We ask, how does private equity still view the sector as we now look forward to, obviously, the next the rest of the decade? There are many good signs, too, as many, as many countries now today, today possess developed, sophisticated plans for tourism growth, which will naturally attract investment. France alone has a plan to increase its numbers of tourism by over 25% by 2026. Investors are looking for an opportunity. So we ask, what is, what is private equity's view of, of the hotel sector today? Last year, the view was that private equity had rediscovered its taste for hotels. And, and actually, the number of deal activity had naturally increased. Now, however, what's the long-term outlook now and how does it look today? Certainly, investors are looking for strong data from the industry, plus focusing far more intently upon ESG strategies. And this has been one of the major changes in the last couple of years. Has this become a central piece of a jigsaw when it comes to investment? All questions to be answered over the next hour and a half. So firstly, let's just ask some poll questions of you um, so we just get a feel for what's going on. Izzy, can I ask if you can bring up the poll questions? Now we have three questions and you'll need to scroll down for the final one, I believe. Uh, question one, do you expect investment in hotels in the next 12 months to change in volume? Buy, and your answer please. Which type of hotels will investors seek to acquire the most in the next 12 months? And that was interesting how that's changed over the last few years. And the final question, what main reason will discourage investors from acquiring or investing in hotels in the next 12 months? I'll be interested in your thoughts on that. Is it, can we see the results? So do you expect investment in hotels in the next 12 months to change in volume? I think grow by 10% or more seems the 41% are answering that's the case, and 34% grow by 5%. That's interesting. Um, which type of hotels will investors seek to acquire the most in the next 12 months? City centre full service, 36%. Resort leisure, 41%. And I think that's one of the big changes we've seen in the last 18 months, isn't it? And what main reason will discourage investors from acquiring or investing in hotels in the next 12 months? 49%, the availability of debt finance, which is obviously one of the key discussions going around the industry at this moment in time. And 22%, obviously, concerned about rising inflation and operating costs. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Thank you for that. Um, Please use the chat at the bottom um, of the screens to ask questions. Um, again, we'll try, we'll try to make sure all your questions get answered, uh, whether in this session or after the session. So if your question doesn't get asked during the session or answered during the session, then we will write to you and actually try to answer the question as well. So rest assured on that. But please feel free to use the chat and ask any questions as we go. And we hope you enjoy the next, the rest of the session. Um, First speaker, may I introduce Graham Smith, Managing Director of Alex Partners, to the screen. Good morning, Graham. I'll hand over to you. Good luck. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate that. And um, welcome, everybody. Let me just uh, share my screen. Okay. 
Great, hopefully everybody can see that. So good morning, everybody. Um, my name's Graham Smith. Uh, I'm a Partner Managing Director at, uh, at Alex Partners. I specialise in providing corporate finance and restructuring advice across the travel, hospitality and leisure industry. Um, and have worked a lot in the hotel uh, sector over the last uh, 10 to 12 years. So I'm going to uh, provide a perspective on private equity in the hotel uh, industry and uh, more of the background uh, around that to feed into then uh, Charles Human from HVS, who's going to um, continue that topic. So in my presentation today, what I'm going to cover is the backdrop in terms of the funds raised by private equity more generally and how that's feeding through into deal activity. Look at some of the key issues that private equity are considering in the sector uh, right now, uh, and also some of the, the positive considerations that are feeding into those decisions as well. Uh, then look at a little comparison between the performance um, in equity values for, for the hotel industry relative to general real estate. Then I'm going to look at actually what lessons can we learn from how the market recovered from the credit crunch, the great financial crisis um, back in uh, 2012 onwards, and what we might learn from that in terms of what will happen next over the next 12 to 18 months. So first of all, what it's clear when we look at the data, certainly across uh, the US and also Europe in terms of the funds raised, we hear a lot about this dry powder. Um, and we can see as we look at the uh, chart here, which looks at funds raised initially across uh, real estate, private equity, a very consistent level of capital being raised for investment. But then once you add on top of that, then the broader private equity industry we can see that you know, these are significant sums that have been raised consistently over the last five years, ready to be invested in the sector and the uh, industry more broadly. Um, what we also looked at is actually what's happened to the number of funds um, that are being raised by private equity. And of course, this is across the whole industry rather than simply hotels, but the fund count, so the number of funds that have been raising money um, has dropped in recent times, but the funds raised have remained broadly the same, which just goes to show the, the scale of funds uh, is increasing. So predominance of the larger funds being successful, they're raising capital. And what we can see is this has absolutely flowed through into broad deal activity, uh, again, across uh, USA and Europe. And we can see as we recover from the pandemic, then actually there was this rush of uh, M&A activity through 2021, which continued into 2022, once you take into account the forecast deals towards the end of the year. But what we would note from this is that actually within 2022, this was really a, a game of two halves and we saw that activity really dropped off as we went into the second half of 2022, and this really being driven by the economic uncertainty which arose at that time. And we saw a number of triggers around that. So both from an operational perspective with increasing energy costs, the availability and cost of people, general inflation and the cost of living crisis. But of course, what's incredibly important for the, the hotel industry as an operational real estate sector is that the step up in the increase in cost of debt finance was significant and rapid over the second half of 2022 and also that fed through into actually just a simple availability of debt finance uh, in, it is there to support deals so as we got towards the end of the year what we really saw was in the second half then Deals that were getting completed were generally those which were uh, well progressed already. And we saw this predominance of, of wait and see uh, becoming almost, if you like, kind of accepted wisdom as we came towards the end of the year. What we also saw when we look at private equity and more of the hedge fund money, um, then it, it pivoted into more liquid uh, investments, whether it's the public markets or traded credit, because 
that's where people could see really uh, deep value in those trades, but also the ability with them being liquid to be able to trade in and out of those when, when the profit was realized. So if we go through to the position that we have today, there are a number of uh, key issues that uh, private equity are focused on, which are, are, are well known, but I think the, the continued um, uh, high level of the energy costs that uh, businesses are facing, we are seeing a reduction in the wholesale prices, but um, it's not feeding through quite as quickly into the, um, the cost that operators uh, are having to pay in their, their energy bills, which remains at an elevated level. We're seeing that continued input cost inflation, uh, both in operations, but I think also importantly in developments. So a lot of uh, hotel developments based on uh, assumptions which happened uh, developed pre-pandemic I think they're now having to be readjusted in terms of the, the cost of development and the, the, the completion of those and whether that still works from a returns perspective. Staffing continues to be uh, a challenge. We've seen the increase in staff costs as the uh, national minimum living wage uh, increased again at the start of the new tax year. I think availability challenges have um, become less acute but are still very difficult. We've also heard in the intro from, uh, from Chris around the investment needs that are uh, there in relation to uh, ESG and the environmental regulations. So that's uh, an increasing focus uh, when looking at hotel projects. We talked about the cost of finance increasing, but also really the availability of executable deals, just general volumes, but also those which can be transacted where we get that matchup between buyer and seller price expectations. But I would point to a number of uh, positive considerations that are really being experienced by the hotel industry, and particularly relative to uh, broader real estate. So the yield management, the daily pricing of rooms that hotels are able to influence, we've absolutely seen that um, be a positive for the industry is being able to um, deal with and offset the input cost inflation that has been felt. And the demand actually for travel, uh, particularly leisure and also domestic corporate has rebounded incredibly strongly. So hotels have been able to significantly increase rates. We're yet to see the full reopening of all the long haul routes, in particular China. So that's still to come in terms of potential increase of demand in the future. Um, also, given the disruption in the market, we see the ability for actually the strength in, in operations. So good managers being able to differentiate themselves in hotel performance because of the operational disruption that's being experienced. There is this need for investment to drive uh, development, uh, the ESG investment that's required, but also to invest in technology to keep pace with what customers are expecting. So from a private equity perspective, with the dry powder that's been raised that we've talked about already, I think that combines to create some, um, uh, some situations in the market which are then positive for private equity investment. And interestingly, what we've uh, looked at is, well, how have hotels performed relative to broad real estate on the equity market? So this is a chart looking at equity share price performance of a basket of UK hotel listed companies and comparing that to the UK FTSE 350 real estate index. Going back to July 2022, when this disruption in the financing markets and inflation really started to take hold. And what we can see from that um, presentation is that the share prices of the UK uh, hotel basket has outperformed broader real estate by 35 percentage points over that period. So I think this talks to the ability of hotels to be able to offset and deal with the inflationary challenges relative to perhaps real estate, which has its um, uh, RPI linked uh, rent, but take longer to respond to that inflation. So we look back in terms of actually what, how did the hotel market react and respond after the credit crunch? 
we've got a, a chart here which sort of illustrates how broadly values recovered um, post 2012 and some of the phases that the market went through. First of all, we had the initial crisis phase, which everybody well experienced from from 2008 onwards. But as we emerged from that, we saw an initial period of deleveraging where lots of MPL sales um, and more of the, the investors who were comfortable dealing with those complex uh, situations, conducting those transactions, particularly, as I say, relating to the deleveraging from the banks. We then went through an asset management phase where after the assets are transferred into um, private equity ownership, then actually a transition into particular funds that were focused more on that kind of operational performance improvement, maybe dealing with some of those issues which had built up through the crisis. And then moving into what we've termed more of the institutional phase. So after that initial turnaround has been implemented, we're getting more into a business as usual um, situation, then transitioning to more institutional private equity. And then the final phase is we felt we were running through uh, towards the end of 2019, which is more about financial structuring. What are the different opportunities uh, in terms of financial instruments to reduce cost of capital to ensure that with the valuations and how they've improved, you can still get the right return for the investors in those deals. So a few different phases. Um, I think what's going to be interesting as well, as we have deals restart, uh, what type of deals, what style of deal will they be? So what we're seeing as to where we are right now is the deal pipeline is starting to grow. There's significant dry powder to be invested. I think we've seen a, a subsiding of that real volatility, certainly from an operational perspective and a financing perspective, and all of that going towards making it possible to look at deals again and start to see that unlock. Uh, a couple of things I think will be important for that. First of all, I think we have still got this position of buyer and seller value expectations. And uh, from the sell side, you know, we've seen that impact on profitability and we've seen that impact on the cost of finance Then, you know, views of how that impacts on, on value. But also, I think one of the key catalysts that might see deal activity pick up is that we have got uh, a wave of debt maturities that are coming up. And with the increased cost of finance, where profitability might be, does that create a, a, a funding gap that needs to be met that might trigger either refinancings or possibly even uh, asset transactions themselves. So I think in terms of what, what's next, then I think it's important that actually the deal types will be very situation specific because of the disruption that the market has seen. But we think, thinking back to that recovery from the, the GFC, three types of deals might well come to the fore over the next 12 months or so. First of all, we do expect to see some deleveraging. Um, not significant NPL sales as we saw out of the credit crisis, but I think some, some banks some lenders may be looking to reduce overall exposure to the sector through refinancing um, and, and possibly asset sales. I think more of that asset management style deal where there's a need for capital and perhaps enhanced, um, more experienced operational input to deal with some of that um, operational disruption to recover value. And then also looking at some financial structuring style uh, transactions where uh, you've got a good business, but the balance sheet isn't quite right for the current levels of, of performance. Maybe there's a need to plug a funding gap or provide financing to bridge to that recovery or also fund growth in the business itself. So I think the catalyst might be uncertain as to what really kickstarts deal activity, but I think we've seen in previous recoveries that actually once the first deal happens, then you typically see a number of deals start to flow from that. So hopefully that's provided everybody with a bit of a, a backdrop in terms of what we're seeing um, in the market and um, look forward to the rest of the discussion. Hey, Graham, coming back. Oh, yeah, I'm back on now. Um, a couple of questions uh, from the audience. Oh. Firstly, there's a question that someone notes that domestic 
blue collar travel is obviously increasing. Is it really true, though, in relation to white collar travel? Yeah, certainly from the, the conversations we have with, with operators um, across the market, then um, yeah, they are seeing a return of, uh, of white collar travel. Some of it is, um, is a little different. It may not quite be the frequency that it was before, but I think companies are uh, really encouraging teams to get back together, to meet in person. We're perhaps seeing an increase in uh, the volume of smaller meetings rather than perhaps the, the larger set piece events. Um, but no, I think there is, the, there is um, a recovery uh, in that, and um, it certainly seems quite broad based across the country, certainly from a UK perspective. Thank you. And the next question is, which companies are included in the UK hotel basket? Uh, yeah, so this looks at um, PPHE, it looks at IHG, and it looks at Whitbread. Great, thank you. And your outlook going forward, how do you feel? Positive? I mean, it's obviously been a mix over the last six months. What do you view now? Yeah, I think that there is, um, I say one of the reasons why we put the comparison up to broader real estate is I think there's been a, um, a, a bit of a tendency to try and uh, look at overall impacts on, on all real estate, all operational real estate. And um, I think what has struck us certainly has been yeah, the ability of, of hotels to offset those inflationary pressures through pricing. And there's also been a, um, a benefit in terms of some supply coming out of the industry, particularly with some of the government contracts. Um, and all that has meant to, um, that for the industry itself, there's a, there's a greater match of supply and demand, which has given some of the pricing pressure, uh, pricing strength to the, uh, the hotel operators. Great. Graham, thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you very much for your time this morning. Um, now, can I invite Charles Human from HVS to come and join us? Charles, good morning. And I'll pass over to you. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think Izzy's got my slides, if they could be put up. So what, what I'm going to do is just take a few minutes to run through some trends in private equity investment in European hotels, both past and present, really to follow on from what Graham has said. So if you go to the first slide. So this looks back over the last uh, 20 odd years and shows uh, the level of private equity investment in, in European hotels. It wasn't really until the mid 2000s that, that private equity really established themselves as as players prior to that, there had been some sort of opportunity funds and, and, and so-called vulture funds, but it wasn't really until 2004, 2005 that things really took off. And since then, average volume uh, of investment by private equity funds in European hotels has been 2.5 billion per year. And that, that compares to total average annual volume of just under 14 billion. So it's about 18% of total volume, which possibly sounds low given given the importance we all put on on, on private equity funds uh, there have been some big highs in those years so 2007 big year possibly not the wisest to move given given what was to come shortly afterwards and then big investments in 2014 and 15 uh, principally in some large portfolios that have been uh, restructured um, following the, 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 the GFC and then more moderate levels of investment. Um, next slide. Generally, the, pre, the private equity funds want scale and they particularly like platforms. So 70% since 2000, 70% of acquisitions have been in, in portfolios. The average deal size has been about 120 million and the sweet spot, so 70% of deals have been within the 45 million to 170 million range very little private equity investment in smaller deals. Next slide. So of total, total portfolio transactions since 2004, 25% have been from PE funds. And over the same time, they've, they've, they've invested in 12% of single assets. Next slide. So this, this shows, um, average, so it shows annual PE investment into European hotels compared to other investors. So other investors include the likes of the institutions, the REITs, the family offices, um, hotel investment companies and operators who are, I think it's fair to say, typically have lower uh, lower cost of capital, long-term holders, 
uh, compared to the PE funds who are looking more opportunistically, more short term. And what's interesting here is the divergence that really started from 2015, 16, where other types of investors uh, in increased uh, proportionally their, their investment hotels and and uh, lower activity, relatively speaking, from the PE funds. And what this is really showing is PE funds selling to other lower cost of capital investors. And the PE funds are finding it increasingly difficult to compete against other investors who with lower, lower, lower cost of capital. So the likes of the listed real estate companies around town, Pandox and so forth, um, Covivio, AXA, some of the big longer term investors with, with lower cost of capital. Next slide. So over the last five years, 70% of PE acquisitions have, have come from uh, 10, 10 uh, PE funds listed here, pretty much all, all household names, Blackstone obviously, uh, are the biggest of the lot, Brookfield also, but very significant investments, but 70% coming from these, these funds. Next slide. So the PE funds have been a very active sellers as well as buyers. So it's 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 almost a mirror image here of of of, of purchases and sales, and it reflects the short term, the intended short term nature of a, of, of private equity investment. So forty eight billion has cumulatively been acquired over this period, and thirty nine billion in sales. Uh, a slight lag effect, but um, so very 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 strong on on both sides of the coin. And what we've seen, I think, uh, private equity funds will typically say that they look at buying with a with a with an intended holding period of somewhere between three and five years, and and more hoping for three rather than five or even shorter. And we've seen those holding periods reduce over time. So what this chart shows is in 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 a particular year. So if you take um, to two thousand and five, for instance, of the acquisitions made in that year the average hold period has been 11 years, reducing down to 2014 of three years. So uh, this, this shows primarily the impact of the global financial crisis where PE funds had bought prior to that and then had to hold on to achieve their pricing targets uh, and couldn't sell at a period of low values. And as, as values have recovered and the market has, has improved, holding periods have become shorter and shorter. But it's likely that that's now going to rise with the impact of COVID and, 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 the, and the issues that we're facing now. So we will almost certainly see PE funds holding on for, for longer than originally intended. So it's, it's interesting to see that hotels are one of three uh, sectors within real estate where the allocation of PE funds has increased since pre-pandemic. So, logistics is one hotel hospitality is the other and, and healthcare and offices very marginally but you know not surprisingly declines in retail um you know against backdrops of uncertainty in other sectors so it, it, certainly on a, on a relative basis pe funds view hospitality and hotels as being um areas of opportunity both short and and long term Where have they been buying? Uh, really, long term, the UK has been a, been a big focus. But what we've seen more recently is is more focused on Mediterranean markets, resort markets. Spain has been a big focus. Um, increasingly, Italy, and there's been so those those are the markets that have seen most activity over the last five years. UK was 2022. UK was saw most uh, more, more more activity than any other market with a couple of large portfolio acquisitions, very little, low levels of investment into uh, Germany and, and particularly low into France over that period. And what we've seen, and Graham touched on this, what we've seen really is since the middle of last year when interest rates started to rise, we've seen a pretty strong slowdown in private, private equity investment uh, in, in, into hotels, more challenging times, um, harder to harder to leverage which is which is pretty crucial to a, to a PU fund story uh, uh more expensive cost of debt lower, lower levels of debt available so since July 2022 there's been 
around 400 million euros of private equity investment into hotels. And that, that compares to 10 billion from other types of investors. So it's a fraction of investment, total investment into the market. And year to date, 2023, there's been 150 million invested compared to 3 billion from, from others. So only 5% of total, in, total, uh, total investment into hotels. You know, what this does show is that the market is by no means at a standstill and that there, there is transa transaction activity but it's not really from the PE funds. Um, where, where have they been buying more recently? It's a mix, Belgium, Spain, uh, and, and, and various you know, deals in Germany, France, and Sweden. Who's, who's been active? You can see here, so Lone Star, Sonoeg, Catman, uh, Apollo have, have all been active, uh, but relatively low levels of activity generally. It's a, so it's a tough time for, for private equity funds to, to make acquisitions at the moment. There's, there's low levels of debt available. The cost of that debt is significantly higher. And that we haven't yet really seen a movement in, in, in pricing uh, from, from sellers. So the private equity funds are really biding their time, waiting for uh, either reduced, reduced values or improved debt markets. Um, and what... What they have become is more active as as uh, as debt players with with debt funds. It's a, it's a it's a good market to be a lender in, in many ways, and, and and I think many are more focused on that side of their business rather than the equity side. We are seeing signs of of sellers uh, reducing pricing ex expectations to get deals across the line. Um, the, the, the increasing debt maturities are likely to present opportunities and activity. This, this is a significant challenge that, that the market will face over the coming 12 months. And that we think will almost certainly lead to, to more activity, probably lower values to be expected and more, 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 more activity for the private equity funds. So I hope that's helpful. That's um, just a really a quick, quick run through. Charles, that was great. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Really interesting. Uh, a few questions for you from the audience. Firstly, what do you believe is the reason for the little private equity investment in Germany? I, I think, um, I mean, the, the war is going back 10, 10 years or more, I think. Um, I think it's a number of factors. Um, one is a lot of hotels, they're released. And that's not really a model the private equity funds follow. They want to take operating risk. So there's, there's less opportunity from, from that point of view. And I think they've just found better value. It's, a, it's been a very low yielding market driven by very low interest rates. It's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a low yielding market with, with, with kind of relatively stable growth and better opportunities in the more uh, unexploited markets, particularly of, of, of Southern Europe. I mean, it's interesting to me, it's interesting how your presentation obviously mirrored Graham's in lots of ways. What's your outlook going forward, can I ask? What's our outlook? What's our what your outlook on the future? Yeah, I, think, I, th I think it's going, this year is, is, is going to be quite a tough year all around. We, we, we are seeing, uh, although um, inflationary pressures look like they're going to ease off, it's a pretty tough time for hotels at the moment. Top line is is holding up, more or less, it seems, but margins are being squeezed uh you know, debt maturities are, are, are a big issue so we think it's going to be a pretty tough time to be honest and we it's it's hard to imagine the values are going to do anything other than decline uh, to some extent over the next next few months so we, we we expect to see activity pick up towards the latter part of the year but not really in earnest until uh 2024 probably Okay, that's great. Charles, thank you very much. Now, just a favour for you, there's a number of questions on the on the Q&A. Could you just take a few minutes to answer them after the presentations? That would be very kind. My pleasure. Yeah, that would be very nice of him. Um, thank you for that. Great presentation, as I said. Now, can I introduce Russell Kett, Chair, Chair of HVS London, to join us? Hello, Russell. Nice to see you. Hi. Morning, I'll pass over to you. Everyone, and, uh... Um, if I can invite my um, colleagues on the panel to uh, join us on screen as well, that will be great. We've got uh, uh, a wonderful, a wonderful and experienced panel uh, of people who know everything that uh, is to be known and will do their best to answer 
both my questions and yours. Uh, and, and I do stress uh, the desire that we should answer questions uh, from our distinguished audiences uh, as uh, you have already started putting questions in the Q&A. We'll, we'll try and answer as many of them as we can. Uh, your questions matter more than the ones that I've prepared. So uh, please make sure that we get the opportunity to uh, deal with the hot buttons that you have. So uh, a welcome uh, to these six distinguished experts. Um, and I hold their opinions in, in extremely high regard. So four come from the world of private equity, Jan Willem, Tina, Sabine, Chris. We have a lender, Louise, and a lawyer, James, to boot. So um, whatever we say, uh, James will pick up the pieces afterwards and make sure we don't get sued. And uh, hopefully we'll have uh, a lot of interest uh, in what you have all got to say. Now, we all saw at the very beginning of the session that there were three polling questions. Um, so I'd like you all uh, very briefly just to tell me um, how you would have replied to each of them. So the first one was, do you expect investment in hotels in the next 12 months to change in volume? Okay, so was it growing by 10% or more, growing by 5%, which seemed to be uh, between the two of them, everybody expects things to grow. Very little remaining the same, and hardly anybody expects it to decline. So um, just very quickly, Louise, what, what's, what's your view on that question? 10% or more. 10% or more. Chris? Growth, 10% or more. Jan Willem, any, any difference? Oh, I think it will increase. 10% or more. Uh, similar, yeah, similar. Okay, Sabine? 10% or more, same thing. And James, you're not going to disagree with all of these wonderful people, are you? Uh, only slightly more pessimistic, because I think there are two things. Number one, it's about finding the opportunities. And as we're seeing at the moment, it's very hard for people to secure opportunities because they're just not coming to market. I, I guess you've got a question whether that's relative to the last six months, which has been very quiet as well. But yeah, okay. it's going to be a challenge to find deals. OK, and if people are going to uh, uh, acquire, um, and given what Charles and uh, Graham have been saying, maybe, maybe not. Um, what are they going to acquire most? Is it going to be city centre, conference, suburban, limited service or resorts? You saw what the answer was. Uh, Tina, what, 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 what's, your, what's your plug? I suppose I don't really like to pick a segment because I think it's quite dependent on market opportunities. Um, but I suspect people will continue to be investing in good markets or so city centres with strong demand, um, as well as leisure uh, resorts. Um, but for us personally, we look much more around what is the operational plan, what is the platform growth trajectory, and what is the management team like? Okay. Sabine? Yeah, I can only echo actually, Tina, because it's a case by case, isn't it? Right. So what we like is certainly we like to go into markets where we see, you know, kind of deep um, kind of liquidity in markets. I mean, we have we have the opinion. It's really good to know at what price level you're going in. But if you want to get out, you should be able to. So you don't want to find yourself in a market that doesn't provide you for those opportunities. And uh, other than that, certainly um, uh, we do like for a number of reasons more the kind of urban um, um, kind of um, hotels simply because there is also always a live after in case if something, you know, you decide to change usage, which is obviously some of the areas that our development team are quite well reversed in. So, uh, but but we certainly agree that there's lots of opportunities for in leisure currently. And uh, I think this has been proven as well by the statistics we saw early on from uh, uh, HVS as well. Lovely, lovely. Uh, James, quick one from you. I think it's going to be Euro European leisure. European leisure. Jan Willem? <laughs> Uh, anything really where we can have some value add. So, you know, uh, city center, resorts, airport locations, but uh, anything where we can, you know, do something with CapEx, you know, rebranding, converting management contracts into franchises, do some cost cutting. So anything value add really. Wonderful. Chris. I agree with all these guys. It's gateway cities. <laughs> Everybody's in violent agreement with each the, other. The, the, the one thing that I the one thing that I will pick up on there is I thought it was interesting that zero people said mice and conference hotels. Yeah. And if everyone's flocking to the key things, the value is going to go up, right? And the contrarian play is to go into mice and conference. Um, talking our own book slightly, but what we're seeing across our Devere portfolio is the meetings and event space is holding up. 
uh, a lot of the kind of meetings that are happening are uh you know people are keen to get their teams back together they're not doing that in their offices they're doing that offsite um yeah. there's still a lot of regulatory training and so yeah, again it's just interesting to see people's perception of that market as the worst one to invest in which creates an opportunity for people to invest in it okay so louise bring up the rear on this one <laughs> well obviously i'm coming at it from the different angles so for me it's the center hope hotels because they're the most stable throughout the various cycles. Um, so yes, I accept the opportunities for private equity will be elsewhere. Wonderful, okay. And the final question we asked, and, and, I, and then I'm gonna move off is so a very quick answer. Um, the main reason that's gonna discourage investors from acquiring or investing in hotels in the next 12 months, um, most people seem to feel that the availability of debt finance um, uh, was gonna be uh, the, the main one. Uh, concerns about rising inflation, need to invest in capex, uh, lack of available supply, and, and then the geopolitical stuff. And Bid asked if it very very little traction on that one. So Louise, it's all down to you, is it? Uh, <laughs> ability of debt finance is that 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 going to be uh, the biggest block? Um, potentially. I mean, debt finance is there, and what we have seen is new entrants come into the financing market. Unfortunately, the debt quantums that people were used to receiving are curtailed, and uh, there's nothing that we can do about that. It is a symptom of the increased interest costs, and assets can only accommodate so much debt. Um, okay. So definitely the amount of, the, of debt that you can put out on an asset is lower than um, what you were originally requested for. Uh, any of the panel want to disagree or, or enhance on that particular one? Chris, are you? Uh, well, I guess it's, um, I guess the biggest thing is the lack of available assets that are on the market. Um, and the, I guess if there, as Louise says, right, there is debt there, it's just how much, and that just goes to pricing. So right. it's, it's the bid ask spread and the availability of kid on the market that's probably the biggest factor. Okay, Jan Willem, anything different? No, oh, I think that's, I mean, I'm still worried about some of the recovery, particularly in Germany. Uh, the UK seems, and even including the region of the UK, but London obviously done really well, but if the region done pretty well in terms of the recovery of the occupancy and the, and the average room rate is up quite a bit. But uh, there are some pockets where the recovery has not been that strong. So I'm still quite worried about that and how that's going to pan out. So Germany, Austria, Switzerland, some pockets in the Netherlands, some some pockets in Central Europe where the occupancies are not recovered at all, close to 2019 numbers. The average room rates are also hoovering uh, four years later, still around the 2019 numbers, so with significant amount of inflation pressure in all of these countries. Okay. Uh, Sabine, yeah, a, a, any view that challenges anything that's been said already? No, I think, um, you know, I agree again with what my panelists said. I do believe as well that I think the uh, operational side to hospitality is still something that some parties are shying away from. Uh, uh, so I think that, and, and simply because, as you all know, the, uh, you know, significant increased uh, uh, kind of costs that come along with labor, uh, the ability to find labor and to retain kind of staff is obviously is, is, is not a trivial exercise. Um, I do want to say, though, that some institutional investors and, you know, we all know, I guess, you know, some of the, the, the likes that have already started to, to, to form a firmer view are starting now to come into the hospitality space. And I thought, think this is an interesting trend to see. So these are people who are not necessarily running after value at opportunistic returns, but they're happy with core plus and uh, they are you know, capital that traditionally would have uh, not certainly not entered hospitality. So to my mind, the sign that uh, uh, there is a certain level of appreciation that if you get your head around the operations, this is indeed an asset class and can assist you in, in driving alpha returns. Okay, Tina? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, as you guys know, um, we've been a private equity fund that's only invested in travel and leisure for the last three decades. So we don't really rotate into other asset classes. And I think um, as opposed to shying away from operational levers, we see that as our way to have a competitive edge and to create alpha and to beat inflation a lot of pressures, right? Um, I think the hotel sector outperformed um, CPI during the last high inflation period in the US in the 70s by one and a half times more broadly and two times for the resort sector. Um, that, you know, I think that that's a 
really good trend for, and for this asset class as we enter into this high inflationary period. Um, and that operational lever, I suppose, is where we still see opportunity, frankly, in Europe, because there's still a lot of family-owned businesses. There's still a lot of um, undermanaged, under um, capitalized, and um, uh, a lot of capex that you can spend to drive that alpha. Um, and that's where we're hopeful to find some opportunities, despite some of the other market challenges. Lovely. And last but not least, James. Sorry, Russell, just uh, I, I'm muting myself. Um, I, <clears throat> I, I think it's going to be uh, an interesting uh, challenge around um, where, where the best place to invest is. So um, I, I agree with Grivatina in terms of um, for them, the, the, for the equity who fund me on the set, it will be easier for them to go forward. OK, so let's uh, let's move to a few questions that I've prepared and I'll, and I'll start to look at what's in the Q&A and, and, and see if there's something there that we can bring out as well. But just kick us off, if you don't mind. Um, I want one particular uh, aspect of the hotel sector from each of you. What excites you most at the moment, Louise? Having a full set of 12 month trading record that I can actually look back and make some assumptions again. So I think after three years, the various different closes and disruptions, just the return to normalcy is exciting. So Louise yearns for a 12 months PL that doesn't have any excuses. Uh, Chris, what's yours? What excites you most? I think what, what's it getting us most excited at the moment is kind of picking up Graham's slides around where we're at in the cycle and the kind of probably the deleveraging that needs to happen um, and the opportunity that creates for well capitalized private equity, right? Uh, for a long time, it's been very, we've been competing with a lot of lower cost capital. And I think now there's opportunity to really kind of differentiate and for us to kind of push up the risk curve and um, do some deals that other guys are a bit, um, kind of find a bit taxing or get a bit of indigestion over, which for the last kind of four or five years or so, COVID ex excluded, was um, it was just, you know, the guy that paid the highest price won. Okay. Tina, were you the paying the part, the highest price? <laughs> what, what particular well, excites you? Um, but but uh, I guess, I suppose for us, what we're really excited is we've spent the past few years investing in, in growth platforms. And now we have a strategy either in city center Europe, um, in mid-scale regional UK and boutique UK and boutique um, pan-Europe. Um, and we believe that those platforms can really go after their acquisition strategy and their growth strategy, particularly as debt financing and pressures um, come in and hit individual owners. Um, those are probably assets we wouldn't acquire as a private equity fund on a standalone basis. But these platforms, these management teams are very well positioned to take advantage of those opportunities in the coming months. OK, yeah, Jan Willem, we've heard what's not exciting you. What is exciting you? Uh, and I think that is really kind of, again, going back to the value add. So where we can reposition, rebrand anything else and, and, and more activity coming out and more assets being put on the market, I think is really going to excite a lot of people to go back into hotel investment because there was a lot of competition uh, for quite cheap money for quite a long period of time. And I think also not only the refinancing is going to go and create some uh, opportunities and people uh, deleveraging, but also I think the redemptions with the larger institutions could also result in some more kind of hotels being put on the market. Sabine, are you in line with that? What's particularly exciting you? Yeah, I simply like the fact that we now seem to have arrived at a point whereby the overall outlook for the industry is actually quite positive, right? Uh, there is a, 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 a sense of, you know, things kind of ramping up again, and we already alluded as well to the point where we are in the cycle perspective. And yet at the same time, um, if you look at, it's true, some of the ownership of the assets, you know, some of the leverage levels that uh, some of these hotel owners currently are confronted with and the resulting interest costs are just not sustainable. So I guess uh, for us, that creates opportunity. And then also along the lines of what Jan Willem said, 
absolutely the value add because there was a long time whereby people call themselves you know doing value add by basically just ramping up the LTV to 75 percent it was possible because you know money didn't cost a lot now it's really from our perspective back to basics and as we have the as I mentioned development toolkit in-house and also the day-to-day -day operations of assets so we don't have to really go out and ask anybody else to do it for us um, I think we are well positioned to to hopefully harvest in some of those opportunities thank you finally James um... You know, what is particularly exciting, either you or your clients at the moment? I, I think, um, I mean, it's a number of things. First, firstly, the, the potential of the Far East and tourist return. I mean, London and uh, Edinburgh number have performed extremely well uh, without that, and they're all coming back. I think, just touch on the interest rates, I, I think clearly the opportunities this year are going to arise as a result of that refinancing rule and the higher interest rates. So that is going to force people to sell assets. It's going to force through some, some innovative funding structures as well, which um, for the private equity on their debt side, um, we're starting to see those sort of whole debt solutions coming through to address the funding shortfalls that are coming up. Okay, and just starting with you and uh, just looking at the other side of the coin, uh, what aspect is causing you particular concern? Just one aspect each of you, please. Go back to you. Starting with me. I, I think the big question, the point we touched on earlier, the, the, that bid-ask gap and how long it's going to take for it to compress because things will only start moving again once sellers and buyers are in the same place on price and then they're not there at the moment. And Louise? As the lender, it's got to be interest cost movements and um, our assumptions around them. Chris? Um, Jan Williams' point about how long that rev par kind of takes to recover or where it has recovered, how, how long it can hold up versus how far it's got to come back. And Tina? I think all the macro factors have been mentioned. So I'll say one of the things that we talk a lot about as a firm right now across our portfolio company actually is cybersecurity. And so that's, um, we think that that is something that all our portfolio companies, all the operators really need to um, get up to speed on as fast as possible. But frankly, it's very hard to catch up to these high hackers and what um, what's being out there in terms of um, attacking these systems. So that keeps us up at night more than perhaps in the macro trends that you can manage through cycle. Good to know. Sabine? Yeah, I uh, believe that uh, the areas where we have some level of control on, I think we feel a bit more comfortable, you know, such as, you know, operating models and kind of making sure you drive efficiencies and all the rest of it. So what 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 keeps me up at night is indeed things that we have very little control on, though, which are, you know, interest rate movements, which are indeed kind of geopolitical tensions, um, energy prices and the like. Um, having said that, the latter is apparently now coming down quite nicely, but uh, these are so it's 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 the big pictures where, as I said, you know, as a you know private equity player, you have very little, I guess, influence on, and, and and yet it will have significant implications on the performance of your of your investment. The problem with coming last of the group of six, Jan Willem, is that everybody else has chosen the one that you particularly wanted to mention. But uh, what aspect is causing you particular concern at the moment? I think the one thing is on the investment side, I'm quite worried about how we're going to find the middle ground and get a price agreed. So obviously your, you know, your, your returns are going to be measured by how much finance you can put on it. And that's gone down and the cost of the financing, all the PE guys are all levered. And ultimately that means that your unlevered returns need to go up or your price needs to come down. And I think we haven't met that middle ground yet clearly because, you know, there's obviously there are willing buyers and willing sellers so very little transactions get done. So until that happens, then uh, it's going to be quite tough to, to get any transactions done. All right. So I'm going to move on to the role of private equity in the hotel investment arena because we've got some great expertise on the panel today. Um, and I'm going to give you each the opportunity to answer uh, a particular question that, uh, that I've identified that, that I'd like you to uh, concentrate on. So, Chris, I'm, I'm going to start with you. Um, how can the hotel sector make the best use of PE funding? Got it. Uh, okay, so I think it's well, as in how do PE when PE buy into new opportunities or kind of guys looking to fundraise or either or both? Uh, either. No, well, but, so, don't, but so, don't take a long time over answering. Cool. Well, so I guess there's you know, as um, kind of uh, Charles mentioned earlier, a lot of our business ha businesses have been growing the credit side of their businesses. So, as Blackstone, Apollo. KSL do it as well, right? Actually providing uh, 
senior loans and MES financing to existing platform businesses. Um, that's definitely an area that um, Louise will see, you know, increased competition in, right, versus your traditional lending sources. And then on the on the acquisition side, um, it's the same themes we've been talking about. It's really where we're focused is the value add. Um, taking something that's got e either a broken balance sheet or broken operations, and then you know, to using our balance sheet and our expertise um, to reposition that asset. You know, that's really the focus. Okay. Uh, and Louise, how much interference should a funder have on a hotel's day-to-day -day operation? Well, ideally, none. I mean, we're financing specialists in what they do. Um, they should know more than us about the business that they're operating. Obviously, unfortunately, there are times where we have to sit together and um, buy into a turnaround plan. Uh, we've definitely seen that a lot over the last three years. Um, but the relationship should be strong enough that we're, we are buying into a, a valid business plan that a specialist has put together. Okay. Now, Tina, you've said that you concentrate only on hotels, so um, you don't have experience of uh, other sectors to draw on, but maybe Sabine can answer the question as to uh, what your experience of other sectors uh, can bring to the table to improve uh, what PE can bring to the hotel sector. Sure, I think, uh, so from our side, having, yes, a spike, I guess, in hospitality, but also, you know, having invested, developed and operated other asset classes such as retail or commercial and the resi helps us to look at an asset for what it is, which is a brick and mortar in a certain location. And sometimes you just need to be able to say, maybe we want to, you know, increase the room count, but maybe sometimes the answer is, guess what, guys, we probably decrease the room count or we take out the conference facilities or we add a different usage downstairs or do we think about rented residencies, uh, you know, how, what else can we do in a parking lot? So I think by by having, again, the ability to look at an opportunity, not just through the eyes of a hotel investor, but generally as a real estate investor. And that allows us to really identify what's the best use of this, as I said, brick and mortar in that location. Um, can I give you specific examples? No, because it really afterwards is a case by case. But I think that itself already, I hope at least, allows for us to, to, to maximize returns. And as I mentioned as well, that's why we do like urban locations quite a bit, because it always allows to have or to solve if we wanted to for different usages as well. Just, just one point of clarification. We um we don't do office or commercial real estate, but we're a private equity fund that does broader travel and leisure, right? So we'll do fitness, we'll do membership businesses, golf and country clubs, and um and ski resorts. And we I do think that those um, operational best practices and toolkits and trends have a lot of interesting corollaries with the hotel sector. And we try to make sure that all the management teams have that um, knowledge base and best practice sharing. Wonderful. Um, Jan Willem, how can private equity add the most value to the hotel sector? Um, I think they're really, you know, buying undervalued, under capex stock and optimizing some of the operating structures, particularly converting management contracts into franchise, which seems to be a trend. Franchise seems to be the way to go. So there's a lot of a lot of stuff to be done there. I think uh, that seemed to be, you know, branding clearly is another option. Okay, um, and and I'll I'll open to you guys, but uh, James, you can have first dibs. Um, what aspects of hotel funding uh, do you think that private equity is mostly going to focus on in the coming uh, twelve months or so? You know, are we going to be focused on the traditional existing hotels? Uh, is it going to be providing junior or MES debt? Uh, and how uh, you know, does that compare with you know, the equity side? Are you only looking at branded? Will you look at independent leases versus freeholds and so forth? And what are you not going to focus on? You know, are you going to focus on uh, everything other than new development, for example? So, James, from your experience as to what your clients are looking at, where do you think that answer is? Yeah, I, I guess you know, if you look at it in a rising market, which we've had up until summer last year, it was quite easy to make investments. Yes, you could do value add, but you could make your returns by virtue in some ways of the prices rising. I think the suspicion must be over the next two to three years, that's going to be very hard to achieve. So I think for, for investors, be it private or anything else, it's about how do I take an asset 
and add value. I think one of the things we haven't talked about and quite interesting, and Tina, I know you invest in one of them, um, is things like uh, apart hotels, service department, hotel and co-living, those kind of sectors that are a bit new and a bit different, I think where people may say, well, that's where the opportunity is to take something totally different roll it out and do something different with it rather than traditionally investing in city centre Hiltons and Marriott's and oh, where you've got a much more defined asset. I think you, people are going to have to be inventive as to how they get the returns of their IRR target returns on capital. One, Tina? Um, it's a good question. I'd say in terms of the cap sack, first you're going to, we, we're already seeing in the US at least our debt funds being quite active. Um, I think when you're kind of in this part of the cycle, that this location first comes for the, the credit funds and alternative lenders. Um, and so they're quite active. We're excited about that opportunity. Certainly from the equity perspective, we're um, very much on the lookout for when the values do come in line with our expectations of where the macro is. Jan Willem? Uh, I think clearly focus on existing hotels rather than new builds. I think they will not be very active, uh, preferably portfolios versus a single asset. But, you know, they're also starting to do PE funds are also starting to do aggregation uh, games. They've done that in, in, in many other sectors. So I think we're going to see a few of those where they start buying smaller assets and start to put portfolios together. Uh, obviously, uh, mass financing because of the lack of debt or, or the top of the debt. A free old versus, uh, versus lease portfolios in my mind. I can't see them being very active buying you know, lease opcos, basically. Uh, new development, I think, will be limited. Okay, Sabine. Yeah, I mean, I, again, pretty much echo here what uh, what we heard so far. I think the uh, uh, the opportunity certainly there's a lot of talk about that side, and uh, I think that uh, rightly so. Again, given that obviously senior lenders are being, I guess, restricted uh, to some level uh, from ICR covenants and the like, I think that that probably creates quite significant opportunity across the board. By the way, not just for hospitality. Um, I do think that there is a value to be found for you know converting independent hotels into internationally branded ones as we already had before and then uh, you know i think depending on the market i mean there is there, there can be obviously value in 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 uh, you know taking these whole assets and trying to convert them back into freehold uh, i think for us you know we are agnostic but obviously the clear preference for investors normally would be the freehold title right eventually so um i think from that perspective, yeah, that's kind of, the, I guess, the focus of classical private equity. Uh, Russell, the only thing we haven't really mentioned here, which is kind of interesting, is the kind of the debt of the office. And I wonder if PE on the long term are going to start to be interested to start to convert offices into, let's say, budget hotels. I mean, that's not been a key, we, key, we did, not been we did a that priority so far, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me if there, there's going to be some PE guys out there who are going to do conversions. So we, so we, did, not, we did convert Sabine's one. Sabine's going to tell us that she's done it. But go ahead. Yeah, well, just to say, we, we did convert one. The only issue with that is obviously the it works actually reasonably well with, let's say, some older, smaller size B stock offices, right, that obviously are facing considerable kind of valuation issues currently, um, uh, you know, also from an ESG perspective. The only issue with that is sometimes, you know, if the floor plate is too big, too large, the issue is as a practical one because your room will only have a certain length. And so as a result of that, if the floor plate is too large, and obviously you need to have as well, you know, windows or natural light, uh, you can't just, you know, build your room like, you know, two meters times, you know, 10. It, it, it just has to have a certain minimum kind of width as well. And, uh, you know, short of just putting a hole into the heart of that building in the middle, which is obviously highly inefficient, for the bigger offices, I'm not sure how well these conversions, you know, uh, are kind of will materialize. But yeah, you're right. So we, we did it on a these smaller size B office and, and it actually works quite well. And of course, if, if you've got larger floor plates, that gives opportunities to the uh, hostel sector who can make just bigger rooms sure. and use those dead spaces in the middle of buildings. Okay. Yeah, the conversion map still needs to work though, right, to Sabine's point. Because um, yeah. some of these offices aren't located where that traveler would go or um, the valuation of price per square foot for those commercial offices for some of them might not work from a conversion story. But I agree, it's it's there. It's just, it's not this, everything can be converted into hotels and it solves the, the problem of office space. <laughs> yeah, I mean, actually, I have a theory about retail. Um, you know, we know the, the way the retail sector is going. If you've got these big department stores, leave the middle of the floor plate to retail and take the outside of the buildings where the windows are, 
uh, and, and put hotel rooms around it. But anyway, that's for another time. Chris, Chris Penny. And we're just picking up what the guys have said. It is definitely going to be the trend, right? I think new build development is super expensive with what's happened with labour inflation. So repurposing existing buildings is much more cost effective. Um, and the same thing of moving from independence to two brands. Um, it's really interesting talking to Marriott, Hilton, IHG. They're all pushing their soft refurbishment brands. Um, so that you know, really trying to get that that refurbishment cost down and plug it into their distribution system. Um, I think a lot of a lot of uh, independent owners kind of got through COVID with various government supports, taking out extra C bills, extra loans, etc. And now that those guys are coming up for a refinancing, and there's the opportunity to plug it into you know something like a Marriott as an autograph or. IHG as a VOCO or whatever, right? And you know, that that's gonna be um uh you know, I think a, a few more assets going in that direction. Thank you. So Louise, it's interesting that none of our private equity players um seems to want to get into providing mezzanine plans finance or junior debt or whatever, sort of leaving the road free to the traditional lenders. But um what's what's your view on um uh, what most people are gonna to want to be seeing? Uh, investment in. Um, do you, for example, get involved in development finance for those that have the courage and the, the will to want to uh, build from scratch? Yeah, we're still doing development finance. I think the, um, the pipeline of development projects is much smaller, um, but there are, you know, still plenty of um, investors that are, it's costly to not do anything with their sites. Um, and development finance is achievable. It is um, it is higher priced at the moment because it does come with a higher risk. We have to be clear that it is at the current times, the inflationary pressures, it is higher risk. But I think it's taken a step back and um, understanding the, the projects in detail, specifically their procurement plans, which parts should we be able to lock down costs on, which parts should we be adding more inflationary assumptions to. Um, so I don't think the development will stop um potentially it's more high net worth investors where they can hold uh, their projects for a longer term than it is private equity at the current time and i think that that is key that in order to really maximize your investment the holding horizons are longer okay i'm going to maybe, maybe i can just add um one thing i think chris and i both work for firms um that have credit funds um and those those that team i think are really excited about the, the junior piece you're talking about, because frankly, let senior lenders, their LTV is lower than what the actual ask is out there for total proceeds. So I think if, um, if anything, that's where we're seeing the most activity and opportunity in the US is our credit team. Interesting. Yeah, exactly. It's just the, just the return hurdle for the opportunity yeah. fund, right? Yeah. Okay, look, um, thanks guys. Um, I'm gonna look to our uh, distinguished audience to ask the next question. Um, First of all, follow up on the rising cost of capital, both equity and debt. Would you consider club deals and having multiple investors on board to lower that cost? What are the pros and cons of something like that further down the line? So um, club deals, any interest, young Willem? I've not really seen that, I think, but uh, in the past, I think, you know, all the PAs, they don't really need any other capital, I guess. Mixing it up with lower capital requirements and yeah. funds, I think, is going to be difficult. And Tina, we've done it on club deals, larger deals. It's not; it doesn't solve for cost of capital issue because most of the time we're partnering with another private equity fund like KKR that has the same cost capital as us. But um, we did it on Apple Leisure Group as well as on our um, Ross Aviation, which is our private um, aviation business in the U.S. And that was more of a question of bringing complementary skill sets and also um capital to the table for a large deal um but it doesn't really as i say solve the cost of capital issue and and for you sabine are you uh, involved in any or, or interested in it i mean certainly in theory you can but then you know practically you look at issues like again the mandate we normally have is not we're not passive right we're active so you're becoming part of a club and then you know who's controlled you know it, it, it's not impossible and certainly you know we do but generally speaking it's not a club it's more you know, core investments alongside of, for example, what we do, right? So that's more what we're used to to see actually. 
think we're also like can see your club with the seller. Sometimes the seller stay in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Seller like, financing could help, right? In this day and age, the, the debt financing issues. We've seen that in terms of being creative on capital structure. Exactly. I think, you know, as Graham pointed out in his presentation, like there's no shortage of dry powder. It's, it's only if it's a really large deal. So we teamed up with Blackstone in 2020 when we took down ESA in the US. But that was a $6 billion transaction. Um, so, you know, can you just stress it. the B of billion rather than yeah. the. Yeah, so billion. Yeah, so, yeah, exactly right. And then we've done another, you know, one plus billion of bolt ons on top of that. So, you know, we mega deal in the US, that sort of thing. We, we team up. But um, yeah, it, I think most of the guys on this call will have the capital to do the deals if they if they can get the returns to work, right? Okay. James, any examples of club deals that you've been involved with? Yeah. So, I mean, we've got a number of deals. I mean, Tina, Tina said it. it, it Doing it where the equity is clubbing together is difficult, but bringing in skill sets, we see that quite a lot, where a capital investor who hasn't necessarily got the, the skills to manage and run a hotel will, will team up to do that together, and they may put some capital in as well, vendors staying in the deal. And that sort of thing tends to be more, far more common than sort of JV-type structures between um, private equity, unless it's a very big deal. I'm assuming, Louise, you have nothing to add on this, but if you do, now's, now's the time. No. Another member of our distinguished audience says, to what extent does ESG drive your investment decisions? And he, he points out that uh, typical investment memorandums are remarkably silent on such matters. So, um, you know, what do you see as the role and importance of ESG on the hotel sector, Chris? Um, so it's definitely an important factor, right? It's becoming increasingly so. Um, over the last probably four years, it's gone from something that we talked about at the back end of our investment committee papers to something that's right at, you know, up front in our analysis. Um, the risk of obsolescence in assets is, you know, something that a year, two years ago, no one was concerned about. People just used to get an EPC. And as long as it wasn't an F or something, okay, we're fine. Now we're much more focused on, you know, is this asset, um, you know, the whole UK, European and global economy is moving towards net zero at various speeds and you're going to have to align into that. I think where actually we see the biggest focus on this is um, not just on the investment side, but on the operations and actually using uh, that to drive your returns by you know improving energy efficiency, decreasing the cost. Um, but also, you know, I'll talk my own, company here but you know working with a company like one one hotels and the way that they position those assets on the sustainability point really taps into uh customer demand um and you can drive uh you know a real rate premium because the customer you know wants to travel sustainably wants to go to a hotel that aligns with their beliefs and values and will pay up for that so you know it you know, factors into our, our whole underwrite, but also, you know, operationally, how we're um, how we're ma running our businesses, managing our, our waste and our energy consumption, and it's flowing through into profitability. Sabine, I know you're pretty passionate about ESG. Um, so what what do you have to uh, to say on the subject? How important yeah, I mean, going forward? And you're right. So we've been obviously on this on this uh, kind of road already for quite a while. So as people know, we had the first ESG manager eight years back. And simply because, you know, again, if you are the developer and if you are the day to day operator, you want to make sure you know that you're doing things right. Um, in particular, ground up development initially, and then also now on the on the reconversions of assets as we're going along. I think. I mean, we heard it before, it helps on so many areas, right? I mean, it helps on the energy side, energy bills obviously going up. So that's great if you have a way of how to mitigate that, at least to some level. Um, it helps you from your, um, um, you know, financing as well. I mean, at the moment, everybody talks about green loans and, and you know, the fact that the conditions may not be, from a commercial perspective, so much superior to the standard commercial loans. But fast forward in five years time, we do believe that, you know, as risk management is starting to rule our lives, right? It's going to be, you are ESG compliant, you get a loan, you're not ESG compliant, so you will no longer be compliant for senior banking. And I think that means that the cost of the cost of 
finance is going to go up. Uh, you know, we see it in, you know, when it comes to staffing and, and, and retaining your staff and that the next generation, they, they do take those things serious. So um, important element there. And then, uh, you know, in some areas, you even get, uh, you know, benefits from the government side in the forms of taxes. I mean, um, uh, you know, one of our bigger platforms is obviously in Australasia and there the government gives you a, you know, a final withholding tax kind of break if, if your if you asset happens to be, uh, you know, achieving a high ESG standard. So, so it makes sense already today commercially, plus you're doing the right thing by the environment. And, uh, you know, fact is that in Europe, some of the biggest institutions will no longer be able to, 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 to invest because uh, they're obviously from a, I guess, EU taxonomy perspective, um, you know, if your portfolio, if your overall portfolio doesn't hold a certain percentage of ESG compliant assets, not just in hotels, but again, in general, going forward, uh, you know, you'll be fined. So it's a pretty obvious, from our, from our perspective, it's a pretty obvious thing what people should do. Now, obviously, the big question is, how are we getting there? And as I think 80% of the buildings that will be standing in 2050 already are standing assets, you know, it's really up to us all to figure out ways of how to make those standing assets, you know, and convert them into ESG compliant ones. Um, that's, that, that's, that's certainly a task up on us all. And it's not easy, but, uh, but we just have to work on it. So it's not easy, Tina, or have you found a way to make it easy? No, it's um, it's not easy. And certainly the measurement um, and trying to keep up with exactly what the regulatory um, government is going to want out of a report from a reporting perspective. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of catching up to do, even if you are doing all the right things to get up to speed on the reporting element. I'd say that I would only add, um, I agree with everyone um, in what they say. The only thing I'd add is it's also becoming incredibly important to the employees of our hotel companies. You know, there's certain um, companies that we have today that I think actually are better positioned from a labor market perspective because they align very well to the values of their employees. Um, and so it's it's uh, not just the consumers are demanding it, but it's also our employees. So consumers are demanding it, employees are demanding it, investors are demanding it. Young Willem, how do you how do you make it all stack up? Well, I, I think you know ESG becoming obviously uh, a major item in uh, all the investors' mindset now. I think there's still a lot of confusion and some clarity, lack of clarity about you know what the different metrics are, the requirements. But I think that obviously that over the next couple of years that will be very much clarified and everybody's really focused on it. And ESG reporting is becoming uh, now quite normal in all institutional reporting, both to the banks and to the investors. Um, I think there's still a risk as well on this zombie properties. You know, we're going to you know fall behind, and it will be so expensive to improve and hit these requirements over the next couple of years. Interesting. Um, now, Louise, you're looking at it from a different perspective, but is this now more than just a box ticking exercise as far as you're concerned? Yes, I think so. I mean, um, part of our appetite is financing well capex assets or where the project is to provide capex on those assets. So I think with that in mind, it's it's quite hard for investors to be doing capex without thinking of energy efficiencies and everything else that's going around it. So I think the nature of the business we do um, means that ESG is, is important to those transactions. Um, measuring on an ongoing basis is, is an issue. I think it will be um, interesting when it's all brought into the uniform system of accounts um, to see what type of asset is performing at what level and what looks good over the variety of assets that we finance. You know, it's very easy for a purpose-built uh, limited service asset to be performing at one level, but try pushing that on a luxury asset and something that's been repositioned, they, they look very different. So I think the, the monitoring is going to be, um, needs to be thought through. Interestingly, I was having a conversation yesterday evening with a member of the committee that is responsible for producing the next edition of the uniform system. And I asked her, to what extent are you considering ESG as part of this? Um, and even they are now finally waking up to the fact that this does need to be properly addressed. And I'm hopeful that by the time, I think it's the 15th edition, it's the next one coming out. Uh, by the time we get that, uh, ESG will actually have made more of an impact uh, in that. James, I'm going to ask you to wrap up on this particular uh, topic. and. You know, do you have a good example of a hotel company that's uh, already dealing with 
ESG particularly well? Yes, well, I, well, we have have one on the call, but there, there are a number of people out there who um, are, uh, you know, sort of leading the charge on that. So Lamington and Zeal Hotels, um, again, you know, talk to them. They are very much into that as, as a key part of their business strategy going forward. I, get, I guess there's a couple of things. I, other, you look at other real estate sectors, there has already been government intervention saying you have to hit minimum energy criteria standards. I suspect we will see more and more legislation and it's almost certainly an impact on hotels. They've done offices, they've done residential letting, you know, it is coming our way. The government will be saying you have to hit these standards. What there hasn't been, and this has been discussion we've had lots of times, is um, I've done a number of green loans. The reality is the pool of capital funding those is no different from um, the capital funding and non-green loans. What we haven't seen yet in any great volume is capital allocations that are specifically targeted at green assets. And that is that, I think, is what will come. It's not there yet, it's not in significant numbers yet anyway. But when there is a real distinction between a funds specifically targeting that sector with pricing that is beneficial to do so, that's when we'll be starting to get there. Um, a very quick follow up question to build on what we've been talking about comes from our audience. How much do the panel believe the significant cost of hotels heading towards net zero will affect their valuation aspirations? How much do the panel believe the significant cost of hotels heading towards net zero is going to affect your valuation experiences, uh, aspirations? Uh, Jan Willem, a very quick answer from each of you. Well, valuations will be impacted by the additional capex you need to spend. So, you know. So valuation values are going to go down. Anybody got a different view? All I'd add is all I'd add is that um, I don't think hotels are uh, any worse than any average business anywhere globally, right? So okay. the value of everything will have to go down because we've got to decarbonize the world, right? You've got to find the money the, from somewhere. Okay. Right. Guys, I'm very sorry, but we've got to our last question. We, we, you know, our time has run out so quickly. A very quick answer from each of you, and please don't repeat anything that one of the other panel has mentioned. But I would like to know, in your view, the key trend that you're factoring into your view of the hotel sector over the next 12 months. What key trend are you factoring in, Louise? Uh, probably, unfortunately, interest costs staying higher for longer than what we anticipate. Chris? Uh, the return of Asian travel into Europe. Sabine? The, um, how things are panelling out between people looking for leisure destinations or leisure travel and obviously seeing the, uh, uh, I guess, uh, business travel coming back. Um, James? Whichever shape or form. Uh, for me, I think it's owners having to find cash to inject into deals on refinancing and, and potentially see the stress stay out sales when those don't come through. Jan Willem? The higher cost of renovation and capex. And Tina? Cost of the airfare for travel or just the cost of travel outside of hotel sales. And with that, I bring the session to an end and thank you all very much for your participation. Thank you all very much. Chris? Thank you very much, Russell. That was great. Really interesting discussion. Uh, so thank you to all uh, the panelists. That was very good. Thank you. And, th look, and thank you to all the present presenters this morning. Um, two great and insightful presentations from Graham and Charles, uh, who explain the challenges the industry are facing now. I uh, see my screen's gone pink, so I'm not quite sure why, but um, it adds a bit of flavour. Um, do we agree uh, that we face a challenging rest of 2023? I suspect that is true. But and are we facing a, looking at recovery now in 2024? Question mark. Uh, fascinating panel led by Russell. Um, look, hotel assets have performed relatively well over the, over the last few years, and that's been encouraging. There is clearly an opportunity. And despite all the challenges, and investors are clearly looking for those opportunities, ESG does seem to be becoming a bigger and bigger issue, so it'll be interesting to see how that becomes and grows in time. Um, however, uh, where is the best place to invest? Which, which countries will attract the best investment as we move forward? I think there's clear indications from our, uh, from our speakers, but do you agree? Um, overall, you do get a feeling there's a real sense of positivity 
spreading in the industry, which is gr and growing. I think key, everyone is very nervous about Q1. I think people are glad that Q1 performed as it did, and we are seeing a stronger recovery than perhaps was expected. Um, and overall, the outlook is more positive than perhaps people feared back at the start of the year. Uh, thank you for your questions today. That's obviously a key part. Thank you for your engagement. And uh, thank you to all. And I look forward to, I wish you all a good day and uh, wish you well for the rest of the time. Thank you very much indeed.